Always a delight to be uh, introduced by Jonathan, who knows all my prose ticks. Today I was doing a uh, line edits on the next book, and all the words and odd phrases that I make up and repeat, uh, were, every one of them, every one of them were, was um, pointed out to me. Um, it's, a, it, it's something in my brain. Um, anyway, I'm so happy to be here, um, and um, so happy to talk with Christian, whose, whose book I just finished today is incredible. Um, so I'm just going to read. Um, a little section from the very, very beginning of the fever, and just to, to give the basic premise, um, I kind of wanted to write a book like this since I was a kid, as a, um, as a little kid, um, I was really fascinated with the Salem Witch Trials, um, like a lot of kids, I, I think, right, or not, I don't know, <laughs> now that I say that, that's probably not true, um, but I certainly was, um, and I, uh, uh, I was really sort of haunted by it, and I think maybe it maybe it's a, was a girl thing in part. There were all these girls, young girls, and it was the only book I read when I was a kid um, where they seemed to have a lot of power, and everyone was listening to them. And of course, they used it to to um, great damage, <laughs> but uh, it was really exciting to me. Um, and so I guess I always wanted to write a story about um, a town that's sort of consumed by uh, an illness um, that you don't know if it's coming from without or within. Um, so this is, the fever is loosely based on an outbreak that occurred, um, you now we're in the midst of another different kind of outbreak, but that occurred in upstate New York a couple years ago. Um, and the story centers around the Nash family. So we have Tom, the father, who's a high school science teacher, and his teen children, um, Eli, who's this sort of reluctant hockey star, and Dini, who's the, who's a, who, I'm gonna read the passage, one of her passages. She's 16, she's very earnest, she's very devoted to her friends. And this is a scene just a few pages into the book, um, and she's with her friend Lise in, their middle, in the middle of a test, and, and something happens. At first, Lise's desk chair just seemed to be rocking. Deanie's eyes were on it, watching the motion. The rocking of it made her feel a little sick. It reminded her of something. She wondered if Lise was nervous about the quiz. Lise Daniels, Mrs. Chalmers called out. You're bothering everyone else. It's happening, it's happening, came a low snarl from Lise's delicate pink mouth. Her hands flying up, she grabbed her throat, her body jolting to one side. Then, in one swoop, as if one of the football players had taken his meaty forearm and hurled it, her desk overturned, clattering to the floor. And with it, Lise, her head twisting, slamming into the tiles, her bright red face turned up, mouth teeming with froth. Lise, sighed Mrs. Chalmers, too far in front to see. What is your problem? After, Deanie couldn't get the look on Lisa's face out of her head. Her eyes had shot open seconds after she fell. Why am I here, she'd whispered, blinking ferociously, back arched on the floor, her legs turned in funny ways, her skirt flown up to her waist, Mrs. Chalmers shouting in the hallway for help. Why am I on the floor? It had taken two boys and Mr. Benassia <coughs> from across the hall to get Lise to her feet. Deanie watched them steer her down the hall, her head resting on Billy Gagan's linebacker's shoulder, her long hair thick with floor dust. Deanie, no, Mrs. Chalmers said, taking her firmly by the shoulder. You stay here. But Deanie didn't want to stay, didn't want to join the thrusting clutches of girls whispering behind their lockers, the boys watching Lise turn the corner, her skirt hitched high in the back, her legs bare despite the cold weather, the neon flare of her underpants. At first, they wouldn't let her in the nurse's office. Teeny, her mother isn't even here yet, snipped Mrs. Harris, the head of something called facilities operations. My dad asked me to check on her, Deanie lied, her friend Gabby nodding next to her. The ruse worked, though not for Gabby. Lacking my father is a teacher privileges, she was dispatched to second period. Find out everything, Gabby whispered as Mrs. Harris waved her out. The nurse's office door was ajar, and Deanie could hear Lise calling her name. Everyone could hear, teachers stopping at their mailboxes. Deanie, she cried out. What did I do? Did I do something? Who saw? Peering in the open door, Deanie spotted Lise keeling over the exam table, her lips ribboned with drying froth, one sneaker hanging from her foot. She wasn't wearing any tights, her legs goose-quilled and whiter than the paper sheet beneath her. She... She bit me, said Nurse Tammy, holding her own forearm, which looked wet. She hadn't been working there long, and rumor was a senior athlete with a sore knee had scored two Tylenol codeines from her on her very first day. 
Here, Deanie, head whipping around, this Lee gripped the table edge beneath her thighs, and Nurse Tammy rushed forward trying to help. Deanie, what happened to me? Is everyone talking about it? Did they see what I did? Outside the nurse's office, Mrs. Harris was arguing loudly with someone about something. No one saw, Deanie said. Uh-uh, are you okay? But Lee's couldn't seem to focus, her hands doing some kind of strange wobbling thing in front of her, like she was conducting an invisible concert. I, I, she stuttered her eyes, panicked. Are they laughing at me? Didi wanted to say something reassuring. Lisa's mother, vaguely hysterical under the best of circumstances, would be here any second, and Didi wanted to help while she could. No way, Lizzy, she tried, smiling. Everyone saw your Hello Kitty undies, though. Watch the boys come now. As Didi walked out, a coolness began to sink into her, the feeling that something was wrong, but the wrongness was large and without reference. She'd seen Lise with a hangover with Mono. She'd seen girlfriends throw up behind the loading dock after football games and faint in gym class, their bodies loaded with diet pills and cigarettes. She'd seen Gabby black out in the girls' room after she gave blood, but those times never felt like this. Lying on the floor, her mouth open, tongue lolling, Lise hadn't seemed like a girl at all. It had been a trick of the light. Looking down at Lee's, her lips stretched wide, Deanie had thought for one second that she saw something hanging inside her friend's mouth, something black, like a bat flapping. So that's it. Um, starts to change and it's discovered that he has a slowly growing brain tumor. Of course, a uh, brain tumor will change in many different ways depending on where it's situated in the brain. His tumor is situated right here. This means that he still has the same intelligence. He can remember, he can, he can eat, he can move, he can, he can learn new stuff, but his personality changes. Typical changes for that kind of, of location will be that you lose all empathy in other people, not just like sort of a bit of social intelligence, but really uh, lose empathy. Uh, another thing would be that you um, uh, will have the same mood all the time, and then suddenly explode in anger, suddenly explode in, in, a, in a terror, or it's, it's, it's where the, all emotions are regulated. So it's like if you have some, uh, a shower where it's not really working, you know, it's, just, it's the same, uh, the temperature of the water all the time and suddenly it's too hot to go, that's what it's like. And one also very typical sim uh, symptom will be that you think you're the same and everybody else is changing and acting in a weird way towards you. So this, of course, when something happens to this per to one person, it, it affects everybody in the family. Uh, and there's no doubt that I could have written an entire novel exclusively about this. But it is, is it a crime, isn't it a crime, we can talk about that. It's uh, a lot of stuff happens. It's a high paced book. I've tried to write a page turner. Um, and it's discovered that Frederick has committed a fraud against his own school, brought it to the border of bankruptcy, his own beloved school that he has dedicated his life to. And it started doing that, gambling away the money from the school a year before he had his diagnosis. So, 10 years ago, who was his real self? Now it's obvious that it's completely changed. But at what point in that gradual slide from one person to another can you say he's no longer himself? He's no longer the, the uh, culpable. He should go to prison. The, the sentence should be treatment, not punishment. Um, in that way, it's a crime book because who did it? Well, was it one Frederick or the other Frederick? It was Frederick, but what Frederick? Who did it? So. Um, I'm going to read from the very beginning of the book, 
are the very first pages where nobody knows anything about Frederick having changed yet. We whoosh down between dark rock faces, through hairpin turns down and around past dry, scrub, silver pale trees and back up. Then over a ridge where the car nearly leaves ground and Nicholas and I whoop as our entrails become weightless. The hot Mediterranean air buffets our faces, for all four windows are open. Frederick takes a curve so fast that I grab my headrest. The sea beneath us keeps switching left and right. Normally Frederick's never brave behind the wheel, so I try not to be afraid. And the heat makes the rocks steeper, darker, the lemon groves prickling even more tartly in my nose. The sea shining blue like I've never seen it before. Around yet another rock outcrop, and suddenly we're engulfed by cyclists. I scream, a swamp of neon pink cycling jerseys. I look out the back window. No one's fallen, but they've dismounted from their bikes, clenched fists, open mouths. We round the next curve. Frederick, it's not funny anymore. He doesn't answer. Frederick, he lets out a small sigh and maintains his speed. I observe his long slender fingers wrapped around the wheel. They don't belong to this way of driving. Once I found them erotic, like miniature versions of his body, tall and thin, a swaying, relaxed body, not a speed beams. And is it the speed that makes his eyes look deeper, black, violet, massives? He seems strange, though I can't say what the difference is. Another hard bump, and again all three of us rise into the air. Stop, Frederick, stop, I yell. Nicholas has had his head out the window, and now he pulls it back in. Mom, just leave off. I'm supposed to leave off, I'm supposed to leave off. Your father's driving like a complete madman, he'll kill us. Is that what you want? It's the speed, the colors, the heat and all the outrageous Mallorcan beauty. Nicholas sighs with precisely the same sibilance as his father and against leans his head out the window. Nicholas, keep your head inside, it's dangerous. He acts as if he doesn't hear me. Keep your head in, I say, it's dangerous. Still he doesn't. I don't care if he's 16 now, I turn around and pull him in myself. I use some force and then he stays in his seat. The Mediterranean? shines so brightly it's impossible to look at it straight on. It floats up through the terrain and calls us, like the tunnel of light the dying sea. Come become one with my beauty and eternity. A nudge to Frederick's hand and we'd swerve over the berm and all become weightless again. And then we'd be lifted out of the landscape too. I want to say stop, stop again. Instead I look at our son. Is that having fun? Am I just a killjoy? An oncoming driver lays on his horn. Frederick keeps his eyes fixed on the road before us. They drive like total madmen down here, he says. Will you please drive more slowly, I ask again. Nicholas and Frederick laugh. The road twists, and then we're back in the shadow and close to the rock wall. An oncoming truck suddenly fills the space in front of us. Frederick swings our car up against the rock face, granite grates against the panels with a sound like we've been tossed in a metal grinder. And then we're past. Frederick says, We took out full coverage. The rental agents will cover it all. He doesn't slow down. Now Nicholas pulls on the back of Frederick's seat. Dad, stop, stop! And I join him. Stop the car now! But he doesn't lift his gaze from the road. He sighs like before. I pull back on the handbrake as we drive, he laughs and releases it again. Frederick, look at me, won't you at least do that? He keeps looking straight ahead as he speaks, and as always his voice projects reason and calm. I need to keep my eyes on the road. <laughs>
I brought up the idea of crime, and then you brought it up again in uh, in the introduction to your, to your reading just now. So I, I wanted to just, in a kind of very general way, let's forget about the fact that, and we discussed earlier, how some places categorize people as crime writers, other places do not. Some ghettoize crime, some do not. How do you feel crime, and this is a question for both of you had to discuss it with, with each other. How do you feel about what does crime mean to you in your books? I know that's a big question, but the issue of crime and what it's about. Both of your books have a crime in fact. So yeah. well, um, well, I think we both use it to bring forward something else, right? I mean I don't really agree, I don't really write primarily to figure out who did it. I, I, I read and write to get in touch with the world, to present the world that I have inside me, I feel, or to get in touch with a writer who has it. And I feel the same way with you, that you create a universe, and then, uh, I don't know, maybe you could say that, that the crime story is of the spine of the body, and then all the other stuff needs to be there, but it's sort of making it coherent. Um, so that's definitely what I did. And I used it to bring forward all these philosophical issues of when are we really responsible for anything, which of course is inherent in crime fiction. Yeah, I, 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 I agree completely. For me, I can't imagine having a book without uh, a crime in it because that's the way I think of story. But, but it's really there to put characters under pressure because um, I really I write from character and um, and it's a way of it's sort of a way of you know tearing back the curtain and seeing what seeing what what's really going on. This is certainly true in your book too. If it weren't for this circumstance, uh, both the crime and the brain injury, we wouldn't really see what what this family is made of and the sort of mysteries and, and strangenesses. And, and my book has a family too where all this sort of mysteries and strangeness of the family become revealed because of this this high pressure, this intensity, that everybody sort of being pushed to the edge. So I think it's a it's it's and to, a device would be to diminish it. It's not really a device, it's a, it's a method I would say. A what's right? A method. A method yeah. of giving yeah. something. Yeah. Well it does doesn't it <clears throat> I mean um, any sort of transgression or crime, as Megan just said, it sort of uh, elevates the emotional impact of the situation. So you see characters at a higher pitch or in a situ situation out of their, let's say, norm or certainly. Well, we can all put people under stress in, in a book. It doesn't have to necessarily to be a crime mm -hmm. novel, but of course, pressure will also show people what they are made of. Yes, but. Uh, you. Um... I think it it, uh, it it sort of enables this sort of having having this sort of crime. Sort of your it sort of peels off the layer to the unconscious in some way. It lets a lot of stuff that you know it isn't just like having a bad day at work kind of pressure. It's really showing what you're made of, showing what you really do um, in certain circumstances. When sort of all bets are off. Mm -hmm. sort of pushed against the wall, which I think we certainly see among all the family members in your book. So, I mean, in some ways you could say that all genre books are about everything being at a higher pitch, whether it's horror or melodrama or any of these things. But I think the element of crime is that it also allows for uh, explorations of social issues. Because there's been an argument lately, and I think it's absolutely true, that the crime, the, the crime novel has become a social novel in America, at least, that that's the place where social issues are explored in a way you don't necessarily see in, in literary fiction. And I think that, that, that that's one of the other elements that, that I'm interested in. When, you know, go ahead, sorry, yeah. But when, we, when anybody who listens to us would then now wonder, why does anybody write a book that's not crime, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, which is, uh, which some people do. Mm -hmm. And so the trick will have to be to use the crime to further your universe, where a lot of people will actually use it to confine your universe. So uh, that's also an issue of structure, of using your, the, the structure of your story, getting the match between universe and structure just right. Uh, like, I don't know, um, if you have a tomato plant, what do you call these things? They walk. 
They know they they, they grow up. Um, the trellis. Uh, the trellis. Hmm? trellis. Okay, that's a word I need to know. <laughs> trellis. Okay. So uh, anyway, you can have the tomato plant or it can be growing or something, but if you have it on the completely wrong trellis, right. it's it's off. So um, can I say, ask yeah. you something? <clears throat> you talked about the large world, the small world. Uh, more than you know, a big, big world or a focusing in on the world. I think it's very difficult in the novel to have like this huge, sprawling world. I mean, you do, isn't it? Whether it's a crime novel or not, you have picked out a piece of a world that you are busy structuring like a tomato plant, right? And yes. And you're growing and... Yes. I tend to like uh, writing that really examine, examines something in detail. One of my favorite books will be uh, In Search of Lost Time by my soul Proust, who has this very famous scene of someone drinking a cup of tea with a cookie, and it's eight pages. <laughs> Thrilling! Oh, what's going to happen now with these eight pages of tea drinking? That is kind of my ideal, uh, to f because what I want to do is to, you might call it psychedelic fiction, I write a book that will enlarge how we see everything around us. So some people like to take in this huge universe on maybe a few pages and can write on that. Other people have a taste for finding just like, I don't know, this little thing, this tiny ball of water, and find all the, the, the lights in it, the sounds when I shake it, all, all the details of it, and let it let it sort of let, let the reader become high on the details of our world. It's a surreal David Lynch world. But um, don't you think that, I mean, I, I'm also thinking that, I mean, your world of the academic world, the family world, um, they all become symbolic, as you were saying earlier, about suddenly this person, in, about guilt or innocence. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about Megan's book, in which she takes this larger idea about young women and an idea, I would say a sort of Freudian idea, about hysteria and puts it into, you know, where it was, a small town, but a small town, one family, a group of friends, right? And so, in that way, you know, you have that under the, mic under the microscope, but, you know. Right, yeah, no, I mean, to me, I mean, sort of, I agree with you again, I, to me, it's um, almost the goal, and I, and I felt this reading yours, is almost a hallucinogenic quality when you're reading it. It's so intense, everything is so vivid, that little details, become really Im important and in the in a Freudian way, in the sense of the uncanny, everything feels both very sim very familiar and very off. And that's so perfect for because we both have a brain injury and this mysterious illness that, that overtakes one and it's and so it's both in both cases people who look like people we know but something is wrong. Something is just slightly off. The you know, the voice has changed. Um, in the case of at least who's unconscious through much of the book, her face starts to look different in an unconscious state, which one's face does. And so that sort of sense of the uncanny of something being slightly off is something you really couldn't get if you were doing a macro universe of the book. Yeah, but you know, in both books, in The Fever and in, in um, your latest book, there, there is the idea of losing oneself. Yes. You know, losing oneself to a disease, something nonspecific, chain metamorphosis, you know, all of these bigger ideas that are in that. Yeah, and there's also, I suppose, a sense of paranoia. <laughs> like, I have in Denmark, where a number of people have read this book, I often. Uh, do readings where I have some, well, female readers tell me that they've been lying in bed reading this story about a man who's changed, the husband who's changed <laughs> gradually over the years, become a bit sort of more rigid and, and they go, ah, you know, and I thought I would, I should measure my success if general practitioners in Denmark would just be, hit me because they would just, <clears throat> All the time, women would come in and say, I think my husband has a brain injury. <laughs> that's, that's what I wanted. Uh, and uh, apparently, they uh, achieved it to some degree. <laughs> it, can be, it might be a new uh, grounds for divorce. They'll I mean, just cite the book. This is, such, this, is such a, this is such an interesting thing about divorce. Also, sort of in, in, the, mari in the marital vow, 
we are together with one person for good or for worse, but what if that person is another person, biologically a different person, then what? Could be fun. No, so, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. The, but the idea of the brain, which is very specific in your book, and in, and in, 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 in many ways too, um, I was totally fascinated when you talked about it. And I wondered how much research you, you both did, but how you did in terms of um, this particular kind of brain tumor. And did this idea, did you, I'm wondering how it, what I want to say is, did you find that research and it influenced the book or did you look for something? Yeah. Um, well, this might be a bit long answer, sorry. No, 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 no. So, okay, good. Um, I, started, I started with a curiosity. I, like, I hate the term experimental fiction because I feel we're all experimenting. We all feel that what we're doing is an experiment. We all do want to write something new. I want to write something new, definitely. So how can you write something new? There are out there, downstairs here, that just thousands of books, love stories and thrillers and everything. How can you write something new? I thought a way of writing something new will be to create a universe where the the characters in the universe are different from before. As I see it, we are right now in the middle of a huge change in our understanding of what it is to be a person because we're learning more and more about the brain. People have never known this before, so now of course with the ADHD and depression and all these different diagnoses that people didn't have some decades ago, it's changing what we are, what we think other people are. So I wanted to explore that. Um, so. That led me to do a lot of research into what kind of story I could do to explore how does neurological knowledge change the way people interact and how they see each other, how they, their ability to love, their ability to respect each other if they just consider other people to be sort of biological robots. So that was the start. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I did a ton of research. Um, when I do research, it's my goal, not just to get the facts straight, because that's something you can do, but ideally to immerse myself in the facts to a degree that these facts will enter my subconscious. Um, I want to be able to, to wake at night from dreams that could have been the dreams of my characters. I want to be, almost become them while writing. So that demands I spend years on each book because it takes a few years for something to actually go down to that degree like you know with the 9-11 it took some years before the books would come out the novels would come out it takes time for us to digest the same thing when you when you work on a novel it takes time for us to digest the research so i try to do so much research that it actually it kind of changes me and changes my emotions and then i write from that that's a fascinating answer I mean, and yours was, you had been thinking about, hadn't you been thinking about that story for quite a long time? Well, I always wanted to write something about hysteria, um, and I always read a lot of Freud about hysteria, and then speaking of all these developments in, in, in brain research, is, they, is, is Freud had this theory, we've seen these middle class women in the Victorian era who are all you know, always, you know, in bed all the time and feeling sick and have their throat hurt and have weird twitches and things. And his argument was that the, uh, their body was speaking what their mouth could not say, which is they were unhappy in their lives, they had no power, and um, and no one listened to them. And so he, that was his argument. And and now they and and now today that that is called conversion disorder, and it's proven through brain scans to be actually true. It's like Freud was right, even though. Um, he wasn't right about everything, but, um, <laughs> but, but a lot. But so this sort of fascinated me for a long time, but I couldn't think of a story to work, or, you know, like how does this become a story? Yeah. How does the thing I'm fascinated in become a story? And then there was this case in 2012 in upstate New York of, um, of both conversion disorder and mass hysteria among these teenage girls who developed these, these um, vocal and motor tics. So sort of became a way to think about and manage the story. It just seems so perfect for me because who, you know, who does no one listen to? Teenage girls. And who should they be listening to? Teenage girls. <laughs> 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 yes, <laughs> <laughs> I was with you for a while. Um, 
But can I ask you a question also about that? Yes. Because it seems you have this very strong bond to this whole universe and you're able to present it in a very vivid way. Um, so, seen from the outside, that universe is claustrophobic. Yeah. I mean, they live in a very confined world and they're, they're, they cannot really move much before all the gossip and everything will just go down. Yeah. So, <laughs> big clamp on them. But, um, at the same time, I feel you have a love of this world. Yes. So that's, like, objectively, so many things are actually tough for a teenage, for a 16-year-old girl, like these mm -hmm. girls. But I'd like to hear more about your love of that world at the same time, because I feel that's intricate to the story universe and the tone. Yes, no, um, yeah, it is, it, you know, I've had three books in a row that are set in sort of a teen girl world, and they've all been some, somewhat different and different issues, but it, in some ways it just feels like the, um, for me, the, um, the undiscovered, con the dark continent, because no, nobody is, finds, nobody, the culture itself, sort of is diminishing of teen girls. Teen girls just want to, to buy clothes and they just, you know, want to scream and giggle in the hallways and sort of all these stereotypes we have of teen girls. But my experience of knowing teenage girls and having been one is that it's the it's the most it's this it's this dark, complicated, twisty, confusing time which in which you have to create yourself. Um, when no one thinks that you're worth Created, you know, and so it, I guess it's, it's sort of like you, you know we all return to certain 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 themes or struggles in one's life when one writes, and I think that's the one that just keeps coming back for me, you know, um, that you know there just seems to be so much so much gold to mine there, um, and to make it vivid and to all these sort of awful things we see on TV or movies about teenage girls, a sort of candy-colored universe where everything is great. I just want to like knock that down with each book, you know? Um, because being a teenage girl is beautiful and awful, and, and, and you just don't see that depiction very often. So if you were offered the option to become 16 again, would you run away screaming? Or would you say, yay! Yeah. <laughs> I would run away screaming, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, um, but that's, you know, that's this yeah. interesting thing because yeah. that's actually not really the feeling I get from your book. Mm, yeah. I get that you have this sort of bond, this, I don't know, this, a love of this, of that time also. Yeah, no, it's certainly, there's, there certainly seem, it seems to be some kind of nostalgia in some way from everything being that big at that age. Mm -hmm. Your emotions are at a, at a pitch. Everything is so intense um, and really, Thank God you don't live that way forever. Thank God you have to outgrow that and you're able to manage or monitor your emotions, much like much like with the brain injury in that way. I mean, he becomes in some ways like a teenage, like a psychotic teenager. Right. Or, you know, Absolutely. Um, and his wife tells him, with, you're a teenager. That's right, no impulse control. Yes. And so she and she has a teenage son um, who is far more... Well, actually starts to bond very well with his dad. Yes. Because they're both running around throwing onions after each other in the, <laughs> yeah. in the living room and having a great time. Yeah. While the mom is going, this is, this is not right. What made you <laughs> pick the, the, the wife mother's point of view, I wonder? Uh, again, I was, um, from the outset, fascinated with what's happening with our culture now and how uh, culpability is changing and how if, how can I say that, if, um, if someone today is very sad and, and, and not giving but withdrawn from everything, we'll say maybe he or she has a depression, a hidden depression. Like some decades ago, I would say that's his or her character. So that's going to change, of course, a lot because now we can see in, into the brain, to some extent, it's developing impulse control, as you mentioned, other things. So, for instance, people who are continually maxing out their credit cards today, they'll live a sort of slave existence. They cannot quit their job, they cannot move, they cannot do anything because they're just in, in debt. But maybe in 20 years' time, we'll be able to see what it is. Some people are able to. Uh, to control their impulses, some are not, and it'll be a diagnosis you get pills for it. I don't know. It's it's all, it's, it's impossible. Uh, maybe people who, who beat their spouse today will say you're a horrible monster. Maybe in 30 years' time will say that's aggressive control. Can see where it is in the brain. It's not you. It's a disease. Just like we have now the boys who are or children who are completely impossible in school. It's not them. It's a disease. Of course, this will develop. So what's left? 
If all our character traits are no longer us, what is us? That's what I want to start to, to explore. And that's why, in a way, the brain injury and Frederick is not sort of the, my primary interest. It is how everybody around him change because they start to think that way. They're sort of our um, scouts into the future. What, what are we all going to be like some, some years from now? And it does become contagious. It's really a novel contagion too, yeah. and, and and paranoia. Yes. And and you. This is a very technical question, but I'm sure the the writers in the audience will be interested. You use present tense, yeah. which I, I've used in a couple of my books, and I find it very effective. Did you find that challenging, or what made you choose that? Yeah, um, I did that in my previous book also, and. There's an urgency to it, for yes, sure. Yes, yes. I think, what would you hope I would answer? <laughs> there would be, sometimes there are no answers, right? Yeah. Because you just start writing in its present tense. But it, it certainly seems critical to the book to me in some way. Yes. Because we feel like we're on, we feel like we're on that, in that car the whole book in many ways. Yeah. You yes. know, everything. So, I, I don't know. So, with all my books, I write far much more than is here. So, so multiple times more, a lot of it gets thrown out, some of it because I'm thinking, some of it because it just doesn't feel right. And this of course leads to a way of writing, how do we decide what will end up on the page, where does it come from? And some of it isn't really entirely intellectual or conscious, and I don't know, it just felt that way, and exactly how that happened, I'm not mm -hmm. quite sure, I can, I can say where it comes from, which is okay, you don't yeah. have to know. No, and in some ways maybe we should, you know, yeah, do yeah. Keep <laughs> yeah. Well, if you were, if you uh, if your prior book was written in that way, it must be a comfortable way, a point of view for you to write. And though it is as many mm -hmm. an incredibly urgent way to write in the present, yes. I wanted to go back a moment to what you said to Megan about loving the claustrophobic world she mm -hmm. writes about, and opening that to a slight, a bigger question, which is, love is probably the wrong word, but the devotion that a writer feels and the kind of love they feel toward the world they create, the writing they do, the characters they create. As the reason I <clears throat> say this is that it doesn't matter which character you write. I mean, I this might not make sense to some people, but one of the reasons I didn't like an artist called Dwayne Hansen who made these lifelike casts is, scary. well, that wasn't why I didn't yeah. like them. I didn't like them because it felt to me like the artist had disdain for the characters he was presenting. And I feel like one of the things that I feel about Frederick is that you have a not, let's say not an affection, but you have a care for him. I have an uncanny empathy with a deeply brain damaged <laughs> man. I, I did not set out for that to be that way. But I just, I just, I just completely empathized with him, and no, nobody likes him, and nothing works out. And you see, that goes to yeah. the thing yeah. that you don't have to write a likable character or any of that. But for the writer, the writer has to be committed to that character and care about that character. Yeah. And um, I mean, you have a couple of those girls who are not too. Uh, I love them all. No, yeah, I, 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 think, know. I think that there are books where you can tell the writer doesn't like the characters, and often they're very successful books, and I enjoy them, but I couldn't write that book, you know. I, even the, the characters, to me, that start out as, as, I don't use the word villain, but just for convenience sake, I always end up, you know, and this is certainly true of the fever, one of the, the antagonistic, most antagonistic character in the book is the one I love the most. <laughs> um, and, and I didn't anticipate that either, but you start giving them these, these you start rounding them out as the book goes along. They're, in some ways, it's like they're whispering in your ear, and by the end, they've completely seduced you. And I think that, that that's a, that's a, you know, I like reading those books. I like that, and there's a kind of joy you have in his, in what he does, which mm -hmm. I think makes yes. it exuber, there's an exuberance to his, his bad behavior that's, that's really exciting and especially interesting. And what I want to say, but I don't want to say anything. Say it as well. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it gets really interesting as it goes. For the writers in the audience, yeah. and there aren't many, you know, that sort of, as you say, you know, that sort of love of your character and never the kind of judgment Right. of your character. I, I think it was in Dare Me. I, I was talking yeah. to Megan and I talked about that horrible, nasty little bitch and she said, I love her. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> but in fact, that is how you create compelling characters. You know that how you it is not about judging your character. Right. And you, you want your reader to have to have to the negative feelings. You do yeah. want that, but you, as a you know, they're like your your children in some way. Yeah. Right. Questions from the audience for <clears throat> both writers, either writer. Vito, yes. Uh, I have a question for Megan. Uh, um, on the, the book, um, The End of Everything, I was really struck by the risk that you took. And I was wondering um, what your publisher, your agent, and editor said. The risk is this. The 13-year-old girl who, spoiler alert, yeah. is uh, not the main character, right. but the character for whom everyone's searching. Yeah. Um, she's just 13. She does something that if you read about it in the post, you would think was really creepy. And she this makes a decision, a mature decision, that you wouldn't expect from a 15 year old girl about her life, about her sexuality, right. what she's going to do. And when she gives an explanation towards the end of the book, it's quite rational. And you sit there and you go, yeah. But if you read about it in the post, you go, oh my god, this girl would be many men. So my question to you is, like, did your publisher, your agent, and your uh, editor say, you know, this is really risky. I don't know if we should do this. This is not going to be a Disney movie. Right. Yeah. No, no one did. I got some mean emails <laughs> when the book came out, a few, but, um, but, uh, um. Because that's why it's different from like a conventional crime. It, would have yeah. been, she was I abducted. I would have written the book had I not, like that was what made it different to me. Um, uh, there's so many books about girls being abducted and, and I like all of them actually, but, uh, but, uh, you know, I, uh, um, to me the, to me, what made it interesting is that the thing that we don't want to acknowledge about 13-year-old girl, what, that we know all about 13-year-old boys, is they do have, they do do things they shouldn't, and they do have desires, and we don't like to think about 13-year-old girls having desires, you know, but but they do, um, and I think it makes people so uncomfortable, um, and that seemed really significant to me, the fact that we're still so uncomfortable by this notion. It's so basic. How are, how are girls ever going to discover their sexuality if they're not starting to, to um, push, push the boundaries at 13? That's when you're supposed to be doing it. But we know, living in the adult world, how dangerous that is. How it can be misinterpreted by, by dangerous people. So we want to protect them. And the way we think of to protect them is to pretend that they don't have these feelings. And so that I was really interested in. Um, um, but but no no one no one said don't do it you know maybe my mom. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Christian, it seems like when you describe your book that uh, this one that you spend an ordinary amount of time on the selection of the theme and the characters mm -hmm. and the research, uh, do you do this same degree of? Uh, Evaluation on every book that you write, and how are you going to have enough time to get to the next book? That is a good question. Um, I yes, I'm I'm work hard. I do, I'm a full time writer, and still I finish. It took me I don't know four, five years to write a book. So I'm depending on writing bestsellers every time. Yeah. <laughs> I've done it three times in a row now, but at some point there's going to be a other slip. So I've been, I've been a professional writer for 15 years with three books coming out, uh, and um, uh, yeah. So yes, I take all that. I spend a lot of time, every, and every time I write a book, actually, I write. I write. Let me say this. There are a number of books. As I mentioned before, if you go into a library, if you go into a bookstore, there are so many books, and it's, you go, why should I write a book? What 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 would be the point? And. What I think is that, yes, there are kind of too many books, and they burn them, and they throw them out, and they do everything to them, cut them up. But there are not too many books where people have tried to give their everything. So that's what I do. That's basically what I do. So I, I, I work full time, and every book, I think this is going to be my last book. And every time I'm about to finish, it, never again, I cannot take it. And then it is absolutely um, intoxicating and addictive. So after a few years of going, uh, that's never going to happen again, and doing promotion, then I start the next book. So uh, yeah, for, uh, three, three, four years of writing, and then, uh, and then two years of, of traveling around, promoting it. And, um, 
uh, and also people seem to think that the research is a lot of a lot of the work, but actually, as you also know, there's not there's not really any reason to not do research because because the the, sh the writing to me at least is exhausting. It's like uh, uh, people think that a book is one idea. You've got the idea of the book. It isn't. Every page of every line actually needs an idea. Which words to omit? Which words to put in? Which character to introduce? Should we change these paragraphs up or down in the page? So it's like a continuous brainstorm. It's it's challenging. It's exhausting. And um, research to me is kind of relaxation, and it's not really a big deal. I enjoy it. I, I have a ton of fun with it. Yeah. So it takes. Yes, I spend too much time on my books. I'm sure my my editors would prefer that. I, did it have another way, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> I guess to piggyback out of your answer, actually, um, it, the subject matter seems interesting to me because um, everything seems uncertain to a degree. You know, you're wondering about the, the main character, what's actually going on, and there's this problem of recognition for the characters. And I'm sure to a certain extent to yourself, even though you're doing this additional research, and I'm just wondering, since you say uh, you gain a kind of intimacy with your characters over time and you kind of dream what they're dreaming or whatever, I'm wondering uh, what kind of things are informing you, uh, informing your narrative voice to kind of take it in the direction that it uh, goes in and, and what kind of allowances are you uh, giving to your characters certain insights into the nature of the problem, I guess. What an intriguing question. And I actually really like it um, because it's almost impossible to answer. Uh, I don't know where to start, where to begin, which is such a good thing. Normally when you do Q&As, people will ask you about when do you get up in the morning and what do you do and how do you write? And, and everything is so concrete and it, it, it's actually like one big lie in all these questions. And also the answers are also lie because how we get to our story is puzzling. It's a miracle. You can t talk about, or sit down and go to this library and do all these things, but how do you actually get to it? It's a mystery. And uh, so I really appreciate your question, um, partly because I don't really know how to answer it, <laughs> but I think the question is much closer to the truth about uh, what the writing is like than most answers and most other questions I've heard about it. I don't know, do you have anything? Yeah, anything no, it is so mysterious. It is sometimes it's like an excavation. I feel like I'm underground, you know, when I'm writing. And sometimes it's uh, uh, like chipping away in a large block of, of, yeah. of stone, you know. But there, it's always different. And I, I never know where, you know, it, I feel like yeah, a surprise gets surprised by every sentence. It's like I have the sentence, I don't know where it's going to land. And so it is, it is, it's, it's all lies when, when we say there's a method to it. Because there's lots of, we're just sort of throwing a bunch of stuff in the air and seeing what catches fire. That's That metaphor does not work at all, but, um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but see, I didn't know where the sentence was going to end. Um, so, and I think each book is different too. We try to control, we try to go through routine, the same, this will work the same way as last time. And then, I, mean, I bet you agree, Jonathan, as well. Right. Well, I think that what happens is you, you create things that are comfortable for you, that you think are your yes, method. that's right. And when you notice your work is changing, yeah. it, what happens is your mythology that you created, the, the process breaks down and you have to recreate it for a different, for a different thing. But, yeah. And it usually, yes. I'd like to answer one more time, which is also uh, one of my pet things I like to, to, there are different answers. So another answer would be that I have many approaches to the writing. Some of it will be things I've experienced that just write down. Some of it will be I wake up in the middle of the night and I have a notepad and write everything down. Some of it will be I'll just sit and stare into the computer screen and go, what now for hours and it won't come. That, that, and all these different things, things that come so easy, things that come so much struggling. Also, a lot of it will be kind of playing chess with the story. What will happen if I move this pawn over here? What will happen seven steps ahead? So you think about all this, and the interesting thing is that, that readers cannot see the difference. So maybe it's just, I just wrote down, I've been out for a dinner party, I go, oh, that line, I'm going to use that one go to the bathroom, pretend to have a reason for it other than writing, write down what they're saying. Other parts are just me struggling for three weeks and go, what, 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 and it won't. People cannot see the difference. And that's probably also because I do the rewrite. So it might be that I've 
broken up in the middle of the night, written three pages in 20 minutes, and then afterwards going, what, 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 and how that, oh, it needs to be split up into three sections of the, of the book, and, you, know, you, and the, you get ideas to do that, and you struggle with that. So, so all these different approaches will then merge into the final product. Everything is allowed, you can do anything. First, you wanted to say that I think one of the things you talk about when you say then the <clears throat> reader doesn't see it is one of the things a writer, I, th I believe, never really wants is to be watching the reader. You never want to feel as if you're present on the page mm -hmm. because it's sort of like watching the ballerina sweat. You know, you don't want it, to, you don't want the work. The work and vice process. vice versa, too, though, right? You don't want, uh, it's only, it's working if the reader doesn't know. How you work a strip with it. It yeah. needs to feel. So that's you what, that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. That's what it yeah. is. No, I, I was saying <coughs> the same thing. That you don't, you, you, I started, I thought you started by saying that you don't want to think about the reader, but I mean, no, the reader no, no, should no, be no, thinking no. about the writer. Right? No, yeah. I don't want, I, I don't want the self conscious authorial voice to come in to show me that process because right, you have to, right. you're creating a world. So that world of, that you're creating on the page. Yeah, yeah, we've all read those books where we feel like the, the, the pieces are being moved or yeah. being sort of pushed to think one thing, or being manipulated. And that, you're aware of the yeah. writer in, in, yeah. a different way, in a way that you don't want to be. Yeah, because you want to be there on the page, though. Yeah. You right. want them to come away from the reading the book and think, I know her, I know him. Yes. I know him better than if I've been sort of camping with him for, <laughs> for three weeks. Uh, I mean, and I know this person, that's what you want, right? Now. So, you, so just in what way you're there on the page. Um, I was going to ask, you both like, have these incredibly original like, books and, and you, you go so deeply into character and you talk about, you know, like you were just talking about delving in and, and, and sorting through everything and chipping away and trying to find the story. Have there ever been times where you've started a novel and have abandoned it or just felt like, you know, as original as this is an idea, I can't get to the story, I can't get to the tone, or do you just persevere, is it? Yes, I've abandoned many novels. Um, uh, <laughs> sometimes they don't catch fire, um, and it's the worst, because you have all these ideas. You have a character, you have... Uh, but sometimes then they come back, the end of everything, the, my novel, I started writing it when I was 23 years old, and I wrote the first 40 pages of it, and I didn't know how to construct a story or plot um, at all, at all, and I abandoned it, and then I picked it up uh, 12 years later, and then I knew how to do plots by then, <laughs> um, and it became sort of shimmered to, to life for me, and I figured out how to make it work. I really only had a mood and a set of characters, so sometimes, sometimes there, it's just not its time yet. I think. Have you ever had that experience? I think I have it as part of my sort of standard part of my process, actually, to write something for a year and a half or something, <laughs> and then smash it up. It's not working. So I write, and I go, this is not good enough. Uh, and then I, I crash it. I think of myself as a potter who creates this pot, and I crash it, and then with the pieces, I can create something else. I can create something that you cannot do in the first instance. Or another way of saying it is, you start out as a band, you sing a song, you play some music, <laughs> But then, you do all these things, and then later on, before finishing your book, you're a DJ. You can just slide <laughs> in and out, because it's all there. You've got all these pages, you've got to go into the moves, go into the structure, yeah. take... So I have so many things that I've written that are not in the book, but I don't really consider them abandoned. I th consider them my, my tape loops for my <laughs> DJ practice. They're there on the computer, and I'm, I'm happy with that. That's a great image. You know, what you describe in the pottery class, Hans Hoffman, who was the teacher of all the American abstract expressionist painters, had a school, and he would have the artist draw with black, black, black charcoal with both hands so they wouldn't be aware of their technique, but he would have them do a drawing for at least nine hours, sometimes over a week, and at the end of it, he'd have them tear, tear it up yeah. and take the pieces home and glue them down randomly yeah. and see what that would tell them to. And yeah. partially, it's like you're your own inventory. Yes. You're not really abandoning. Yes. I mean, what Megan talked about was sort of putting it over here. 
you know, until she was ready for it. But there are times, I do think, with many novels, I mean, you have a, your long process allows you to smash the thing apart, come back to it, reimagine it. Yeah. I don't think that, I, most novelists I know have at least two novels in the drawer that they're never going to do anything with, yeah. early novels. Some take them out and they go, oh, this could be beautiful, and they start yeah. doing it. I understand that there are a number of people here who are writing books or sort of taking writing classes, something like that, sort of. So one of my tips will be to be not afraid to write something awful. <laughs> write crap. It, it, everybody does that. You write a really horrible, awful book, and then you let it lie low, and then you smash it up and you do things with it. If you nobody writes a, 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 a great book in the first take. You just don't be afraid of writing something awful. Write awful stuff. And then, later on, be a DJ with it. And that's when you create real work. And that's such a liberating, at least for me, because the first time, the first months you work on a book, it's just, this is horrible. How am I not going to get anywhere? I'm, gonna, I'm a horrible writer. I need to quit. You should not think that way. Be happy with all your awful stuff. That's a tip. Uh, yeah, I, maybe this is a question of genre. Um, I'm thinking of the Stephen Muller trilogy, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Oh, yeah. Um, and Hunger Games, which are incredibly um, appropriate for this age because they're, they're telling you what's going on. And um, I think my background was I took um, comparative literature at Columbia, and we really looked at everything socially. Um, and I'm, I'm just asking you, um, I'm coming here, I have a lot of work that is, um, how would you say, a very, very great scandal in the 90s, it's, it's a political matter. And then the Ferristein's novels um, deal with the same people, and, you know, and they're all very nice, but there were hideous murders and kidnaps behind them. Um, is there a place, I mean, I'm actually seeing a place for growth for young people now, and you know, we're tearing the doors open, you know, as far as those girls upstate. Um, I've been around human trafficking enough to suspect there must be a social code of that that is repressed there. So I'm saying, um, you know, there's a lot of really exciting things coming down, especially with young people. Like sharing Excuse me, because oh. I'm just wondering. Okay. No, no, it's all interesting, but what your question is. My question is, yeah, is it a matter of genre? Am I in the wrong genre? Um, should I be doing literary fiction as opposed to so crime fiction? I think just write your book. Okay. You know, yeah. Just yeah. You don't need to think about just don't um, worry and, about it. Yeah, but at this I point, mean, I mean, even I spoke with Lee Smith, they said, well, why don't you self publish? I'm like, wait a minute. No, you know, that's another question, oh. you know, social. But I was like, well, wait a minute, there should be a place for me. I can't find it. Well, I, 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 I would I say, I'm not, I'm not answering for either of the yeah, writers, but I'm just saying uh, one writes the book they want to write, All and right. it finds its way. It will write to. Well, there's sort of, just, I never I thought mean, about never, what my genre, I mean, the publisher decides the genre to a certain extent, you know, yeah. they, or the, and the bookstore decides where to put on the shelf. But you should write what, what, what you're passionate about. Right. And, and not worry about that. Yeah. You, you know, it's like the orchid, the orchid thief always gets shelved in gardening. Oh, <laughs> oh my god, I love that. Right? So you can't exactly. really worry about that. Yes, yeah, there are books over here. Come meet the authors. Get them to sign a book. Try a book. Say hello. And thank you very much. Thank you.